Recording. All right, guys, we are live. Welcome to the general session of the John Lavinia Success Mastermind. I am Stuart Wilde sitting in for Glenn Henderson uh, on this Wednesday, uh, May 11th, 2022. Um, I am an entrepreneur, uh, a student of mindset, uh, philosophy, um, and success mindset. Um, and I am honored and glad to uh, be with you guys today. Um, I'm grateful to uh, our friend and mentor, John Lavinia, for uh, creating this platform for us to get together um, every day and sometimes a couple times a day to uh, chat about um, life and uh, business uh, mindset, success mindset. Um, and so today uh, I've got some interesting uh, things to chat with you about. Um, I wanted to start uh, with kind of sharing some wins because um, we used to do that and uh, kind of haven't done that in a while. And so uh, I've got some, I've got a few wins I wanted to share with you guys. And maybe you got a couple wins you wanted to share with me. I know you, some of you guys are super busy. I know Lindsay has been working it. Daisy, I want to hear what you've been up to also. Um, <clears throat> so win number one for me is not necessarily a business win, but um, some of you guys know that uh, I do um, conservation work protecting public lands here in New Mexico. And one of the wilderness bills that I've been working on um, since 2015 um, just passed through committee uh, on the Senate on the Senate Natural Resources Committee. So our U.S. Senator uh, Martin Heinrich, who's a friend of mine, um, just uh, introduced this this bill uh, before Congress and it passed this uh, passed committee in the Senate. And uh, the next step is that it'll go before a full, um, a full Senate vote uh, on the floor kind of thing. So that's a, that's a huge win. Uh, and this will protect um, this beautiful special uh, volcano out in the middle of the uh, middle of the valley out here in our national monument. So that's super cool. I'm excited about that. I just did a big interview for the Taos News. So I think there's a story that's gonna come out tomorrow um, and I'll share with you guys, uh, you know, if it comes out and, and if it, and if it, and if it's good enough, um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, second win is, uh, that I, I've been working with, uh, a prestigious university out of Texas on an outdoor leadership program. And I actually, they wanted to do a llama trek with me this year. Um, and because, of, uh, you know, some health issues and, uh, you know, not feeling like I was quite ready to go full blown. Um, I kind of canceled on them, you know, I mean, I didn't cancel, I just didn't um, completely book with these guys, um, because I didn't want to um, commit to something that then I wasn't able to do. And then these guys contacted me. Um, and it looks like I'll be able to work with them in, um, in at least a limited capacity doing some cultural tours. Uh, taking these guys to some Native American ruins, um, talking about uh, working with a, a group of 20 students, essentially, um, talking about the natural history, cultural history, some cultural anthropology uh, of the area, and also incorporating um, uh, some work with a Native American um, spiritual advisor, let's say. So uh, I'm really excited about that. And um, I had a big call with those guys yesterday. And one of the uh, people on the call also works for another university uh, out of Texas. And they were so excited even by just the uh, um, itinerary and the proposal that I was putting together that they're already talking about sending me uh, another group later in the year kind of thing. So once I kind of started wrapping my head around, um, you know, doing this work again, um, you know, it's, it's, it's flowing. So it's a wonderful thing. And then the third win that I'll share with you guys is that um, I've managed to leverage uh, my unique skill set um, and was asked to be a sales rep and consultant for a solar uh, power company that is um, expanding into New Mexico and they need a, a New Mexico regional uh, sales rep. And um, never really done sales like that, but uh, it's something I'm passionate about, alternative energy, um, protecting the environment, uh, self-reliancy, energy independence, things like that. And so um, 
that's a beautiful thing and it could be very, very lucrative. And I'll let you guys know how that works out for me um, over the next several months. So that's super cool. I'm really excited about all that stuff. Um, before I get rolling on uh, today's presentation, anybody wanna share any wins? Gail was just telling me about a cool uh, women's retreat that she's putting together for her church, um, which sounded very impressive and, and very cool. Um, either you guys, any of you guys, Catherine's here too. What's up, Catherine? Any of you guys got anything you wanna share about what you're working on? Lindsay, I know you were you know, out at a big conference or doing something, big Chicago trip. Um, well, my husband, his work, he was at convention and I went with him. Well, he's still there. He'll be there till Saturday. Um, but I came home early because we've still got kids in school. <laughs> and But yeah, we went to a Cubs game and I met a lot of the, I mean, I know the people he works with, but this was, it's nation, you know, nationwide convention. So it's, I met a lot of different wives that you know, potentially could um, turn into some huge wins. So that was a plus. That's awesome. Networking. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. Did you uh, did you go to that conference thinking that that's what you'd be doing, or uh, or maybe maybe a little bit, but uh, it turned out to be better than you thought it might be. It did turn out to be better than I thought because I was just thinking I'm a huge Cubs fan. I'm going to Wrigley Field. <laughs> and my dad grew up in Chicago, so you know it was just something I've, I've never done. And, you know, they called, they want me back. So I'm going back. Um, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, um, I enjoyed Chicago. It was a lot you have of fun. The big, the big foam hand. Yep. Um, <laughs> why I fly the W. Um, so yeah, that's, I came home and hung my, my W flag back out because I had forgotten to this season. So yeah. Um, so it turned out to be better than I had anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited about that. Great. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, so, you know, normally, uh, or when I do these sessions every couple of weeks, um, you guys that know me know that I, I tend to put together a little slideshow, a little presentation. Today, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. Um, I'll kind of start off uh, just kind of chatting and uh, uh, rolling, through, rolling through some thoughts. And then kind of uh, in the middle, uh, I'll, I'll bust out a little uh, photo slideshow and then I'll finish up with some, with some more words and then, uh, and then we can all kind of have a discussion. Um, so let me do a couple things here. I'm just gonna minimize my, my window here. Great, all right. Um, so today, what I wanted to chat with you guys about is um, transforming our experiences, transforming in particular, transforming negative experiences um, into positive ones and um, how we frame and perceive uh, and interpret our experiences and how we choose to experience personal challenges, um, adversity, tragedy, catastrophe, and loss. Uh, and it sounds real serious um, in, a, in a minute, you'll um, understand why. Um, so some of you guys may know if you've been following the news that uh, you know it's wildfire season um, and the largest fire in the US right now is raging in my backyard um, here in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains <clears throat> of Northern New Mexico. The fire is currently, uh, well, there are several fires, um, but the big one is currently about 30 miles uh, as the crow flies uh, southeast of Taos, which is kind of our town, um, which means that it's about 50 miles uh, from, from where I live. Um, you know, there's high winds, uh, fire's moving quick. Um, it's not, uh, uh, you know, very contained or anything like that. I'll share some information and some pictures with you guys as we go. Um, but I will say that, uh, that we are safe, my family's safe, um, all the llamas are safe. Um, we're not in any immediate danger. Um, but that said, um, you know, many people in our county have been evacuated. Um, some of the towns uh, nearby have become um, evacuation shelters uh, for people that have had to leave their homes um, and things like that. And so this is a, this is a big deal. 
Um, so the big, there are several fires in the area. The big one is called the Hermit's Peak Fire. You can look it up, but I'll show you. Um, I'll, I'll show you some pictures. I'll show you a, a map um, as we progress here. Um, but this Hermit's Peak Fire is currently uh, about 210,000 acres. Um, is about 320 square miles um, in size. And so, uh, Lindsay, the, I've, I recently read that um, the fire is uh, larger than uh, the greater Chicago area, um, also greater than uh, the five boroughs of New York City. Um, and here in New Mexico, the, the land mass of the fire is uh, larger than Albuquerque and Santa Fe combined. Um, and I know that Virginia is, uh, our friend Virginia, is uh, staying and working in Albuquerque. Uh, here in New Mexico, she's from Denver, but uh, she's here in the state as well. I'm sure she can see some of the smoke. So the story is that hundreds of homes um, have already been lost, have been uh, burned in the fire, um, which equates to thousands of people, uh, you know, losing their losing their homes. Um, thousands and thousands of people have been um, evacuated, and more and more communities every day as this fire is spreading um, are being evacuated. And this morning I just got a, uh, uh, a notice uh, from our uh, local newspaper that another community um, has been evacuated. Um, thousands more are, are in what they call the go mode. So there's kind of like a ready, set, go, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, progression. And, uh, and lots of people are literally packing up as we speak, um, having to leave their homes. There's more than a thousand firefighters from all over the country that have uh, come to New Mexico to help um, in, the, um, in the fighting of these fires. This big one, this Hermit's Peak Fire, uh, started on April 6th as a controlled burn or a prescribed burn, meaning that it was intentionally set um, by the Forest Service to um, reduce fuel loads uh, in the forest. But the challenge uh, and, and the criticism of, of this um, protocol is, or this decision, let's say, to set this fire is that um, the day that they set it was a high winds day, 25 miles per hour winds with 40 miles per hour gusts and things like that. There were red flag warnings. Um, that were essentially ignored by the folks um, that set this fire. And then, uh, and then of course it spread, um, got out of control um, and has uh, become kind of a major catastrophe for many communities here in the Southern Rockies in Northern New Mexico. Um, so this whole thing is kind of under investigation right now. Um, heads may roll, things like that. Sorry about any, uh, noises there. Let me see if I can turn off my email. Sorry about all that. Emails. Maybe that'll work. Um, and this particular fire, as I mentioned, is uh, more than 210,000 acres. Um, and and they're, they're saying it is 39% contained. And if you understand how wildfires work, um, they can't really say controlled or, or under control. Um, they they kind of say contained. And really what that means is um, can they create fire breaks and can they prevent the fire from spreading in certain areas? And so right now, this, this 210,000 uh, acre fire, this 320 square mile um, behemoth of a blaze is less than half um, contained in a safe way. So it's continuing to spread. And of course we have high winds that are um, expected to continue. So it's kind of a big deal. Smoke uh, is really bad for us up here right now, but um, you know, compared to the people that are losing their homes, um, you know, not a big deal. So there are several other fires. Uh, there's another one that's 39,000 acres that's 97% contained. They kind of got that one under control, so that's nice to hear. There's another one that's 42,000 acres. So I'm kind of surrounded by these wildfires right now, and it's really been um, at the top of, uh, uh, you know, top of mind and, and uh, top of discussion in terms of what everybody's talking about here. So I wanted to chat with you a little bit about wildfires. As you guys know, I'm a wilderness guide, uh, you know, and a naturalist and an ecologist. And so um, I have a unique perspective on 
these wildfires, right? And of course, a lot of people, as you might imagine, are blaming these fires on um, climate change. Um, and of course, uh, you know, you heard me say earlier that uh, that this was actually a uh, an intentionally lit fire that got out of control. Um, but as you may know, fire is a part of the cycles of nature, part of the cycles of life and death uh, and rebirth and renewal. Um, and a little reality check is that, uh, you know, some of the circumstances around uh, the, con the conditions in uh, most of the forests in the West is that these are human caused um, circumstances, meaning for the last hundred or so years, we've been putting out every forest fire um, with the, you know, intention of, um, you know, protecting the forest. And in recent years, in recent decades, we, we've really come to understand that you got to have fire. Um, you have to have fire to clean out the debris in the forest. Otherwise, what happens is the fuel, uh, meaning, you know, the dead trees, um, the dead branches, the sticks and the twigs and, and larger um, dead trees, eventually it builds up uh, to what they call like ladder fuels and they tend to stack one on top of another, right? And then when, um, when there is a fire, then it becomes catastrophic. So um, people kind of look at me funny when I talk about um, healthy fires, right? And so a healthy fire, um, really every 10 to 20 years, you're supposed to have kind of a low creeping uh, brush fire, or ground fire that just kind of sweeps through the forest um, and is like maintenance, if you would. It's like changing the oil in your car kind of thing. You know, every once in a while, you got to have a fire that comes and cleans out uh, the debris in the forest floor. Um, and then, of course, um, that's a low temperature burn. It doesn't climb up the trees and uh, turn into these big crown fires or canopy fires. Um, and it actually creates this nutrient-rich uh, mulch or this um, nutrified uh, biomass, if you would, that um, many of you guys know and have seen uh, where you live that uh, farmers tend to um, burn uh, the grass and things like that. And then when it rains, um, you know, it, it creates this partially digested uh, biomass that then gets, uh, it, it's much easier leached into the soil and then uh, nutrifies the soil and, you know, creates a situation where uh, plants continue to grow and everybody's happy. In a, in a catastrophic situation, you know, we have too much fuel, too many dead trees that haven't burned. You haven't had a fire in 50 years, 60, 70, 80, 100 years in some of these places. Um, and so when there is a fire, man, the whole forest goes, right? And, uh, and once, the, once the fire creeps up the trees um, and starts leaping from treetop to treetop or canopy, uh, what they say, a canopy fire, um, you know, little cross highways and things like that. I'm sure you guys have seen some pretty scary images and things like that. One of the dangers and what's happening here in New Mexico is that these fires are burning so hot that they're actually sterilizing the soil. And so uh, we're losing that nutrification, that um, uh, nutrient rich uh, biomass because the fire burns too hot and the, so the soil actually gets sterilized to the point where um, it's gonna take decades probably for uh, you know, regeneration to happen. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was that we tend to anthropomorphize everything, meaning, you know, we put our own human values on everything, right? Um, and not necessarily nature's uh, uh, way or nature's values. And when it comes to forests, right, we want everything to be green and beautiful. Uh, I'll put beautiful in quotes, right, um, by our own standards, right? We want all, of, we want our forests to always be these lush green, um, thick, you know, beautiful evergreen forests. And the reality is, is that, um, you know, what's the lifespan of a forest? Tens of thousands of years, right? And so every once in a while, you have to have a fire. Um, otherwise, the forest is unhealthy. And um, for a period of time, that forest is going to be burnt and charred and, uh, and in a, in a uh, regenerative uh, cycle. Right, and we tend to assign um, negative value to a forest that has been burned. Right, we'll call it ugly, or we'll say it was destroyed, or something like that. But the reality is, for the most part, again, cycles of nature. You have to have this process go on in order for um, new growth, new life, rebirth, um, and renewal. Right. So again, there's some 
uh, cool metaphors in there that I hope you guys will pick up on uh, when we have our discussion here in a little bit. Um, now, I want to share my screen with you and, uh, and show you a map of this fire. And I see that we've got a few more people that have joined us. Hi, Linda, how you doing? Um, are you, Linda, aren't you supposed to be traveling? Uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually at the Denver airport. Oh, wow. Yeah, I yeah. missed my flight this morning because uh, TSA was so backed up, it was ridiculous. It was like a mile and a half long. Oh, um, so yeah, I had to buy a flight on a different airline. And here I am, but I'll be there. All right, Denver airport, very cool. So uh, you're only a few hours north of me. So uh, so you're in, you know, you're in the heart of uh, fire country as well. So hopefully you've been yeah. listening to what I've been talking about here. I'm going to share. How, how close is it to you, Stuart? Uh, about 50 miles as the as the raven flies, but maybe 35 miles, 30 miles from my wow, not town far. Of towns. Wow. Yeah. So speaking of which, um, so now you guys can you give me a thumbs up. Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, so you can see Santa Fe, the capital here in New Mexico. You guys can see Los Alamos, right? Which of course is uh, infamous for uh, the Manhattan Project um, and the, uh, the creation of the, uh, the atomic bomb, right? So these are the three big fires that are uh, in my um, general region here. And I'll, I'll, I'll shift the map a little bit so you can see. But this, so we have a Las Vegas, New Mexico. This is not uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, right? So just to let you know, if you went, if you tried to go gambling here in Las Vegas, you'd be sorely um, disappointed. Um, but honestly, if you tried to go there now, you would be even more sorely disappointed because this whole area here um, is ablaze right now. So I'm going to click on this. You can see the Hermit's Peak uh, fire um, updated eight hours ago, 203,000 acres, 43% contained. So it's a little more contained than it was this morning. Um, this one here is called the Calf Canyon fire, but they are essentially merged into one fire. Um, all these communities uh, along the eastern slope of the Sangre de Cristos have all been evacuated here. Um, this one here is called the Cook's Peak fire and you can see that that one is now what does it say 97 percent contained 53,000 acres yeah i'm going to move you guys onto the other side of my screen here um and so what i'm going to do is uh now that you can see kind of and then there's this other little guy out here um out in the plains but this is the southern rockies here this is called the sangre de crystal mountains now you can see taos so taos is town for us this is taos county over here so the fire has now crossed our county line. I think you guys can see kind of the southeast uh, corner of Taos County. So um, this is kind of the, the close, uh, you know, 35 miles away. Winds are huge every day these days. And so this fire is just, is just gonna keep rolling um, right through the forest there. So uh, my ranch is right here right at the base of the mountains over here. Um, we're not necessarily in the forest, so we're not uh, in immediate danger. And, and I honestly don't think that this fire is gonna spread and burn the whole mountain range all the way up. Um, but hopefully the winds will die down and they'll be able to uh, get it a little more contained. So anyway, that's kind of what's going on in terms of the, um, in terms of the actual fire. Um, and then, I wanted to show you guys some photos. So I'm gonna do a little slideshow here for you. Whoop. It worked. Okay, one more, one more, good. All right. So guys, this is a picture taken um, right in my backyard. And so this is from my house. So even though, you know, you saw uh, the distance on the map of how far away that fire is, um, you know, and again, that, that fire is maybe 50 miles away, and yet it looks like it's coming right down um, on our on our property. So literally, this is like our backyard. Um, let's see. Here's another photo. This is uh, the south end of Taos, um, and again, these guys are not quite in evacuation mode, but everybody's pretty much freaking out um, in this whole area here. This is the community of Angel Fire. We used to live a few years ago. We sent my son to high school over here and his girlfriend lives really at the base of these mountains over here. And her family is now evacuating. 
they have seven children, they have um, livestock, they're cattle ranchers, and they're essentially, they can't, um, their cattle are not used to loading up in trailers or anything like that. And so they're literally having to abandon their animals. And so a lot of people throughout the region um, are packing up and going. Um, and there's this crazy uncertainty because a lot of these people that are evacuating they have no idea um, what they're going to return to, right? If you, you know, it's one thing, you know, you, your house burns and you kind of get that and that's a horrible, horrible thing. But the other thing is like, if you're just evacuating and you're going to a shelter somewhere or staying somewhere else, you have no idea. It's this crazy, stressful, uncertainty kind of experience of whether or not your, your house is, is going to be there or, or what's going to be there when you, when you show back up. Um, this is one of the trailheads that uh, I take people hiking out of uh, just on the other side of the mountains. And you can see, you know, now you're starting to see much closer to the fire. You can see almost some flames through the smoke, um, more orange than just kind of white smoke closer to the forest kind of thing. Scary stuff. Um, here's uh, one of our sheriff's uh, vehicles, uh, super close uh, to the fire. Um, obviously, they've closed highways and things like that. It's crazy. Could you imagine, uh, you know, living close to this? It's just incredible. Um, so here's a picture. Can you guys see this? It's a, a Chinook helicopter with uh, what they call a, 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 a scoop bucket, right? And so they, they fly these helicopters over the mountain lakes. They dip these, um, essentially a collapsible bucket. They pick up water from a lake. Um, and that, you know, could be you know, several hundred, several thousand gallons and something like that. And then they fly over a certain area and then they dump it and then they go back again. And they may have several of these doing bucket brigades, dumping, dumping water on the fire. But you guys can imagine that it's almost an, an exercise in futility, uh, you know, when you're talking about a fire that size. Um, and then we have these airplanes that uh, are dropping what they call slurry. So it's kind of like a foam kind of thing that uh, will... Um, kind of smother the fire. That's another approach that they're using uh, to put the fire out. Um, same kind of deal here. These guys are dropping water. That's actually a scoop plane. So while they have the helicopters with the buckets, they also have these planes that fly like, uh, like, a, like a pontoon kind of water plane. And as they fly into the lake, they're scooping up water and then they fly over the fire. And they, so, you know, there, this is crazy stuff. And again, you got thousands of people on the ground. One of the most dangerous jobs, as you might imagine, um, these, these firefighters, as they get close to, uh, you know, the fire, oh my goodness, uh, you know, if the winds shift, um, you know, we're talking several thousand degrees and, and uh, you know, potentially people can lose their lives. Um, so it's a big deal. This is an image from the sky from one of these planes over the mountains, uh, just on the other side of the mountain from Santa Fe. Here's a more close up image of, of one section of the fire. You guys can see some of the flames now. Um, this is uh, the town of Las Vegas, New Mexico. Um, so these guys are all evacuated now. Can you imagine this is like your home, in your hometown? This is like a, a, a city. I mean, not, you know, it's not huge, but this is, you know, this is a nice sized town. Um, and these people are, have all left and they don't know what they're gonna come back to. Um, here's a nighttime uh, image of, uh, of some of the uh, fire, you know, kind of on the ground, um, you know, a lot of sparks causing uh, new fires, right? So this is an area that has not been completely uh, devastated yet, let's say, um, but boy, look at this, this is a big deal, right? Um, so again, this is uh, the community of Angel Fire where my son's uh, girlfriend lives um, and her family is all it's all back in life, man. That's hardcore. That puts a couple of tears to my eyes. That's crazy. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> one of my friend's cabins that is no longer there. So people had their homes, hundreds of homes, right, throughout the, the forest. Now, on the one hand, um, this is, you know, a horrible tragedy, uh, you know, for the person that, that owned this home and this property. And yet I also put this picture up because I want you to make note of the decisions that we make as human beings to build our homes 
um, in the forest, right? And here in New Mexico, many, many years ago, um, they came up with the term uh, defensible space. And I don't know if you guys uh, have heard of such a term, but essentially you're required to clear the trees away from your house, like 50 feet away from your house at least, um, so that if there is a fire that moves through the area, that literally your house is not surrounded by trees like this, right? And so on the one hand, it's a horrible tragedy. And on the other hand, it's an example of the decisions that we make as human beings to uh, build our homes um, in dangerous areas, right? Um, and so, you know, you could you can also equate this to the people that build their homes on the mud cliffs uh, in Malibu, or uh, let's say the people in Louisiana, uh, in New Orleans, that uh, build their homes below sea level, and then uh, when the when those levees break, um, you know, then then those whole communities get flooded, right? So I mean, these are these are decisions that we make. I read uh, somewhere recently that every major city on the Eastern Seaboard is built on either a floodplain or an earthquake fault, right? And so literally all of our major major population zones um, are. Uh, you know, a ticking time bomb in terms of what one type of natural disaster or another, whether, you know, forest fires in the West, um, earthquakes, floods, other kind, you know, this is crazy stuff, right? And again, this goes back to like uncertainty. How do we prepare for these things? How do we deal uh, with these things? So check out what people are doing. People are abandoning their animals. They can't take their animals with them. So they're spray painting their phone numbers on their livestock so that, you know, if, if they're not there when they get back, that somebody may find them and, and give them a call. That is such a powerful <laughs> image. Unbelievable, huh? Um, and so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I'll, I have a couple other things that I want to say um, about this and then, and then I'll open the floor uh, for your, for your comments and, and discussion and hopefully you guys will, uh, whoop. Let's see. Hopefully you guys will um, have some things to share with me. So again, obviously this is a horrible, horrible tragedy, um, not only for the people that have lost their homes or will lose their homes um, and their businesses, right? And their livelihoods. Um, a, lot of, a lot of ranching uh, uh, people, ag big agricultural community. Um, and so pasture land is gonna be gone. Um, you know, livestock, uh, you know, may or may not be uh, even viable for these people anymore. Um, the thousands of people um, who have had to evacuate or will have to evacuate and are continually, uh, uh, you know, new calls for evacuations on a daily basis. Um, and again, the, this concept of, of the uncertainty when you leave your house and you pack up a backpack or shove as much stuff in your car as you can do, and then, you know, you cross your fingers and you hope that your stuff is going to be okay when you get there. Um, but for a lot of these people, they know um, that they're going to lose their homes. And a lot of these people are traditional, um, lower income families. They own their own property. They may have built their own house over the course of decades. Um, and, you know, unless, uh, you know, if you own your own property, there's no requirement to have um, insurance, right? And so a lot of these people may literally, you know, lose everything and not be able to um, receive, uh, you know, or file claims or receive compensation or anything like that. Um, entire towns and communities have been um, devastated by this. Um, and then on the natural end of things, on the ecological end of things, um, entire populations of local wildlife have been displaced um, and fragmented. Um, and in some cases have you know, been, uh, you know, burnt and, and, and died in the forest. Um, but this, this, this area, you know, New Mexico is an interesting place, really diverse ecology, where we've got, uh, you know, you see, you, you saw those pictures of the mountains, but really those mountains are all surrounded by very, very dry uh, desert as well. And so, the, you know, the mountains are critical, critical habitat for our local deer, for our, um, for our elk, uh, for the mountain lions, for the bears, uh, you know, for all the creatures uh, of the forest. So this is, this is something that impacts um, all creatures uh, uh, across um, species, uh, 
lines, let's say. Now, this is where kind of mindset um, comes into play. And, and this is really what all this brought up for me, right? And so when faced with tragedy, catastrophe, loss, um, extreme personal challenges, um, adversity, things like that, we have a choice, right? And, and we have a choice of how we choose to experience the events in our lives, right? And depend, this really depends on our worldview, um, our perception, our perspective, our attitude, um, and how we frame, um, and that's kind of been a big word in, in book study, um, several of the last books, right? Pitch Anything, um, but also um, The Gap and the Gain, right? How we choose to frame, how we um, interpret, how we ascribe um, or assign meaning to the events and the circumstances in our lives, right? And uh, the other night, Monday night, um, Bob had said uh, something about, you know, that it's, it's all cool to kind of talk about um, choosing to as ascribe and assign meaning and value to certain experiences, but it's really hard to do in the moment, right? And when you have some more perspective or maybe when your house isn't on fire, uh, you know, you, you have the luxury of, uh, of being an armchair uh, mindset um, practitioner, right? But, you know, imagine the challenges uh, that these people are going through that are evacuating that have lost their homes, right? So it is, it's hard to um, keep, keep positive and keep your mindset uh, in the right place um, in the face of extreme adversity, tragedy, catastrophe, loss, things like that. Um, I wanna drop an Epictetus uh, Stoic quote on you. Uh, when something happens, the only thing in your power is your attitude toward it. It is not the thing that disturbs us, but it's our interpretation of their significance. Um, Marcus Aurelius, another uh, Stoic, and of course I'm dropping some Stoicism because really the, you know, one of the main principles of Stoicism is how to deal with challenges and, and adversity in your life and still um, be able to live a happy life. Um, so the happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. And this is a Marcus Aurelius quote, and he was a great philosopher king, uh, one of the last great uh, Roman uh, emperors. Um, and so really, you guys would agree, um, the same or similar circumstances or events can happen to two or more different people. And depending on that person's mindset or that, that person's attitude, um, you know, they're going to interpret uh, those events and those circumstances very differently, right? And so the challenge is how can we transform these negative experiences into learning experiences, into growth experiences, um, into, uh, you know, a, a mindset with, with a positive outcome? And again, it's much harder to do um, in the heat of it, in the thick of it, let's say. Um, you know, you got some people that are going to go, why me? Uh, poor me. Uh, victim mentality, right? How could this happen to me? Why is God punishing me? Um, I've lost everything, right? And that speaks to, um, let's say, you know, the, 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 the tendency to not be grateful for the things that we do have and the things that did work out in these experiences, right? Versus the person that says, okay, this is a crappy experience. This is horrible. You know, I lost my home or I lost my business or whatever it might be. And then you have the people that are let's say more of the growth mindset that are gonna say, well, what are the lessons in this experience? And what are the opportunities for growth? And how can this make me a better person? How can this make me a stronger person? Um, and again, it kind of harkens to gratitude and being grateful for what we do have and not for what we've lost. Um, and then there's the whole concept of attachment versus detachment um, you know, to the things, material things in our lives. And again, it's easy to do sitting in a chair uh, when my house isn't on fire. Um, but again, I just wanted to bring these things up to see what you guys thought about it, right? And, and then the other, the upside of this is that tragedy, um, catastrophe, and loss has a tendency to bring out the best in people, right? So people coming together as a community. I'm sure you've seen this, whether it's, you know, hurricanes or other natural disasters, right? And how can we be of service 
to our community. And so many of the towns, uh, uh, neighboring, you know, uh, towns to these fires um, have set up evacuation shelters, food banks, people are opening up their homes uh, to strangers, people are offering pastures um, and assistance in evacuating animals and livestock, uh, uh, donating trailers and shuttles, uh, things like that, and people are um, donating money. So we have a charity here in New Mexico. If anybody is interested, I'm not going to pitch it, but if you're interested, I'll put it um, in the chat, um, you know, because there is a statewide charity that is uh, uh, accepting donations to help these folks uh, that are losing their homes, right? Um, and so my question to you, and really where I want to go with this is, have you guys ever gone through uh, uh, an experience of such tragic um, loss and catastrophe in your life? Um, and how did you get through that experience? And what was your mindset that helped you get through that experience? And did you go through phases where maybe at first um, it was much more challenging and then over time, um, you know, you were able to have some perspective and see um, where some of those lessons might lie, right? Looking back on it now, can you identify any life lessons or opportunities for personal growth in these experiences? And then, of course, this is a business mindset, a success mindset um, mastermind. And so, you know, how can this approach, how can this worldview, how can, how can these techniques uh, uh, help us in our businesses? Um, and so that's really where I'm at with this whole uh, fire thing. So, um, you know, I know that, that this is serious uh, um, topic and, and, you know, again, tragedy um, happening in our, in our state and in our communities. Um, but I felt like it was an important opportunity to, uh, you know, bring some of this stuff up and, uh, you know, use it as, a, as an opportunity to, to have a discussion about some of this stuff. So um, I'm gonna shut up and I, I wanna open it up to you guys and hear what you have to say about some of this stuff. So hopefully, hopefully somebody's going to raise their hand or just pop right in. Um, we have in Alabama, we have, I mean, they call it Tornado Alley. I mean, it's not Oklahoma or anything. You can't see them coming, but they were, you know, the foothills of the Appalachian and they pop up everywhere and you know I don't know since I've, I can remember them when I was a kid but since I've been married my I mean my husband's now he's terrified of tornadoes but because I mean we've we've been hit you know I think it was 2011 or 12 we had 50 in one day and it it was destructive <laughs> you know and we got hit that morning before everything even started and you know, I've never been, I mean, I'm, I respect storms greatly, but I also love them too. So, you know, and it's, everybody gets in such a panic and, you know, we've got to go here, you know, we've got to go to a basement. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen that. I've seen a family that left their home and went to the, I want to say it was a brother and sister, went to the sister's house and they had a new baby and they were in their basement and then the mom goes killed. And I mean, that she had a week or two week old baby where their house was not harmed. I mean, tornadoes are unpredictable. They just hop here, you know, you don't see them. That's why, you know, my husband's like, we need to go. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I mean, don't right. scare the kids, you know, leave me alone. Let me go out. I want to see it. You know, if I go out in a tornado, top that. I mean, that's the way I feel about it. I mean, it's, I don't want to, but I think it's amazing to see how they, they, the path of destruction is, is intense. I mean, we lived 50 miles from Tuscaloosa. I mean, Tuscaloosa was really damaged. And I mean, there was mail in our yard from Tuscaloosa, 50 miles away. So, I mean, they really do some damage, but you know, we, where we used to live, we saw it, you know, it completely came around and hit the house next to us and it went around us and hit the house across the street in two places. And I mean, my husband just gets all, you know, I'm like, there's nothing you can do. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I think that was a matter of having faith and responding rather than the reacting. And I don't know. I mean, it's just, but we did see communities come together in a way. I mean, if you're in Alabama, 
football is life. I'm not, I don't like college football, but it's your Alabama, your Auburn. I'm Auburn, by the way, but you saw Alabama, you know, Auburn University was at Alabama helping, you know, with, because it everything was destroyed. I mean, even neighborhoods that you saw neighborhoods were completely, they were gone. So, I mean, it's one of those, in, in my opinion, it's, and it's the same in business, you know, you're going to have like, who, you know, okay, you, you panic or do you handle yourself with, because it, you know, what's going to happen, I think our mindset has a lot to do with what does, you, I don't know, I'm really huge in mindset. If you're expecting something, well, then you might, you know, you're probably going to, so I just think it's, um, obviously you can't, you can't control a tornado, you can't control a fire, but you can have enough faith. I like the, you know, faith of mustard seed can move a mountain, but doubt can create one. So it's just go having that unwavering faith that everything is going to be fine and not react, not just reacting, but thinking before you respond. That's my take on it. And that's just through the tornadoes because a lot of times what I can see from a tornado is what I feel like on the inside, but that's what it looks like on the outside, but you just hold it in. So to me, that's kind of, that, that's my take on that. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know from tornadoes, right? And so that's a whole other thing, but I think you brought up some really <clears throat> points about the unpredictability of natural events, right? And that, um, the family that left their home to go somewhere else and then they got smacked over there and a mother lost her life and a child was left without a mother and horrible, horrible stuff. And if they would have stayed home, then maybe they would have been okay, right? And so, um, yeah, this uncertainty, unpredictability. Um, I really, I agree with you uh, about what you're talking about, about like the awesome power of nature. And on the one hand, it's this kind of horrific, scary kind of thing on the other hand it's this amazing beautiful impressive kind of thing right and unless you're in the path of the tornado you can sit back and go oh man look at that thing that's amazing unless you know it's you know your house that's being torn apart and torn to shreds right um a, a much lesser yeah i mean we had damage but we dealt with it we didn't have power you know electricity for over a week it was kind of i mean that was it was kind of nice so yeah, we did get a generator, you know, and, sure. and run a few things. But when the power came back on, it surged and it, it burned up everything. Like I thought my house, you know, I didn't know if the attic was on fire. Oh my goodness. But I was just like, I don't, I called my husband's work and I couldn't find him. And I said, I, I think my house is on fire. I'm not sure. And they were like, they were like, call Pitt, get him to call his wife. They're like, she was like eerily calm. I was like, what are you going to do? I mean, um, but yeah, it burned up all our appliances and ceiling fans and electronics, but we were good. We're here. Well, and again, you know, being grateful, um, you know, is the foundation of any, of any mindset practice in my opinion. Um, to me, it's like to a much lesser analogy is like you're in traffic and you see uh, cars moving in, in the other lane. And so you change lanes, right? Thinking you're, you're going to, you know, get out of the traffic, right? And then you're stopped right but maybe if you stayed where you were that you know you would have safe passage and of course it's a horrible analogy but i think it's something that we can all relate to if you if you haven't been um in a disaster linda i saw you at hot mic a couple of times what's going on what do you think about it? oh sorry i didn't mean to <laughs> no i mean i've never experienced any catastrophe um type of loss um <clears throat> i have experienced human loss so <sighs> But um, yeah, um, I think in any, any type of you know, loss, the community comes around you. Um, and just being grateful, um, focusing on what you still have instead of what you've lost. Because if you continually focus on what you've lost, you're gonna miss out on everything that you have, so. Wise, wise words from a yeah. wise person. Agreed. Um, you're you're in the Northeast, right? Aren't you in Connecticut? Yes. 
So were you affected by um, Hurricane Sandy a few years ago? No, basically it was the shoreline that got, it, it was like uh, the water surges was, it was the shoreline, we're inland. But yeah, a lot of people, um, my parents had a place in Florida and they had, you know, hurricane threats, but well, there was a big hurricane that came through. I forget, I think it was something with an H. They, uh, they had some damage, Hugo, but. Hugo, Hugo. Hugo, yeah. Um, but nothing, nothing major, you know. So, but you can't control the weather. You can't control the fires. And you just gotta. But you can control what you think and how you. Right, think, exactly. Right? And, and yeah. Gail, I'll get you in a second. Um, but, you know, as, as we're talking about this, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm really of a stoic mindset. And one of these days I'm going to do like stoicism 101. Um, and I almost mm -hmm. did it. I almost did it for this week, but the fires were just like so in my face, literally, that yeah. uh, that this was, you know, what I wanted to talk about. But really, um, this concept of, uh, you know, there's there's only uh, a couple things you can control, right? And it's what you what you think, what you say, and what you do. And it's futile to stress out and worry about anything else. And there's really those are the only things you control can control. Um, and everything else falls in the category of you can't do anything about it. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's another path to living a tranquil life is, uh, you know, to only worry about the things that you have a direct impact on, what you think, what you say, what you do. Gail, how are you? Hi. Um, yeah, just talking, first of all, about the, the fires, you know, I'm from Australia and, and um, it's a country where there's not a lot of water. The temperature can get very, very hot. And I remember one year I was at home visiting my mother who was um, in the hospital and my sister and I were driving to the hospital. The temperature was about 118 degrees. And as we're driving, I'm looking in a field that's fairly barren, but there, there's the grass is brown and everything. All of a sudden, there was, there was just a, one or two trees, and all of a sudden, I saw one tree just suddenly go up in flames in front of our eyes. I've never experienced that before. And there wasn't anyone around who could have started the fire but it had been so hot for so long, so dry, it just spontaneously started burning. Terrible. Thank goodness it was a fairly barren field and the, there weren't many trees because if there had been, it would be one of those uncontrollable fires. And um, I know what you mean by... Um, there are controlled burns and there's also cleaning up. When I went to uh, Switzerland with my husband, he was from there and they have fires, forests, I mean, and the forest floors were immaculate. And I said, how is that? And they have people who go in and that's their job is to clear all of the debris away. I had never ever seen that before. And I think there should be more of that here, but um, it really does cause a problem. As far as um, mindset, you know, I had some pretty horrendous things happen to me as a child and growing up. I won't go into detail, but from those things that happened, I was able to learn, take a lot of stuff and learn what not to do. And I'm a fairly uh, optimistic and positive person. So I'm able, you know, go through a tragedy, pick myself up and keep going. And I've had people, and my husband was the same too. And we've had people say to us, you know, if you didn't, if we didn't know you, the things that you've said, you know, have happened to you, we would say it's all made up. It's, you know, it's, it's just not possible, but it was. It happened to us and they saw what happened. But we never let, us, let it get us down, um, even though, 
you know, there were times where, you know, people say, oh, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And I would scream back at him, you know, how much more can we take, you know? But you keep on going. I think if you, and I know some people can't be positive, but if you, if you dwell on the bad things that happen, then there's no joy left in life. There's no way, if, if you're in a business, you're just going to think, oh, I can't do anything about it, and the business is going to fail. Um, I think you have to look at, at the goal that you want, and you have to just try and keep on going um, and have a positive mindset. Um, I have one daughter, my middle daughter, She's always, always saying, oh, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. Oh, that's a Kyra thing. Oh, you know, all the time she sees nothing but the negative. And I try to teach her not to do that. But, you know, sometimes people are that way. And I just thank God that I'm not. And I've learned a lot from the things through my life. And I just keep on going. So... That's it. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, what, what that brings up for me is um, that, you know, we all um, have had personal tragedies and, uh, and loss in our lives. And, and um, you know, I've, I've said for a long time that, uh, you know, shit happens to everybody. Yeah. And it's, it's really just about how you deal with it. Right, and that's sort of the, you know, that's my East Coast, uh, you know, New Yorker yeah. uh, version of stoicism or whatever, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, as a as a as a llama uh, uh, wilderness uh, outfitter, um, you know, I have a bumper sticker that I made that says uh, "Spit happens." So, um, but uh, you know, I appreciate where you're coming with that, and um, and I'm glad to hear that you know you uh were able to overcome adversity oh, yeah. and challenges in uh in your life and and i hope that we all are able to um retain you know a positive outlook even in the face of um horrible loss and tragedy and, and the, the yeah. more horrible the thing is the harder it is to to stay positive about it whether you're talking about the loss of a loved one or you know property and stuff is is one thing right um, you know, when you're talking about, you know, a, a personal loss like that, it, it becomes much harder to deal with. But again, um, we have to figure out ways to, uh, you know, to incorporate those things, look at um, what those, uh, uh, the, those growth experiences are for us, and how we can move forward in our lives, right? So thank you, Gail. Um, Daisy, what's going on? Daisy, you're in California. And uh, that's like wildfire central, right? And so what, what uh, do you have anything to, to add about this or does this bring up anything for you? Are you there, my friend, Daisy? I'm here. Yay. Sorry, I was in and out of it. Um, oh. But yeah, well, yeah, you know, our, you know, our California situation here where we always have those raging wildfires every time there's a Santa Ana wind that comes through right it never fails and I think most of the ones that have happened so far that we've had were due to arson mm. or due to some kind of you know homeless encampment or something right and but it it was human caused and and of course it happens in those areas where the you know <laughs> where they should have done the, the, you know, the upkeep in terms of cleaning it out. But um, that's always the problem that California has that they don't do. They say they do, but they don't. And then every year it happens, right? Um, so it's a little, it's a little frustrating. And I have this thing about fire. <laughs> I, I'm, um, uh, I think it was 2000, I don't know, it was 1992, there was a fire that was started in, in one of the residential um, areas um, in our area. And I was at work 
at a hospital and um, we heard that there was this fire and um, I said, okay, well, it's kind of close, kind of keeping an eye on it. And so from where I work, I could actually see my, where my house is, it's above a freeway. Um, and so uh, all of a sudden I see, I see the fire like smoke kind of like where like the house in front of my house or where it would be right and I was calling I was calling the house and no one was answering so that freaked me out a little bit and so I I went to my I ran to my supervisor and I said um I said it looks like the fire it looks like the fire jumped the mountain or jumped over the freeway onto our street and um, she looked at it and she was, oh my God, she was, let's go get in the car. So we run into her car, we drive up, um, take the freeway up and they had already closed the freeway or at least they had closed the road. Once we exit, they had already closed the road leading up to my house. <laughs> and we're going, what about my dogs? What about, right, okay. So you're thinking about everything else. All I knew is that for sure my dad was home. I thought maybe my dad would be home because he had, it should have, it was right after he'd come from work about three o'clock in the afternoon. So I said, well, why isn't he answering the phone? And that was, that's what troubled me. So that alone <laughs> kind of freaked us out. So, so we, the, the person who was blocking, who had already, there was already a block. Uh, um, and we, I said, we have to get, I said, you need to get, let us get up there, get up there to get our dogs at least and find out if my dad is there. And so she, he, she goes, I'm sorry, we can't let you in. And my, my supervisor just kept inching the car, inching the car, inching the car and pushing her over. And then finally she, she get, the lady goes, okay. And she kind of led us through. And we, we went up the hill and literally it was, everything was going sideways. The wind was, it was gray and dark. Um, so we knew already, it's like, oh my God, I didn't even know what we're going to, what we're going to see when we get to our house is our house going to be on fire is our so we, we we come up and up and over the hill down to our street and um yet the house in front of us the roof was already on fire and um there were people who we didn't know i don't even know who these people were they were on top of our roof with their with our hose hosing down our our um our roof i don't even know them wow. two guys angels I'm i don't know your house that's amazing and uh, uh, i was knocking on the door no one was answering i went in no one was there and i go okay where's my dad he must have gone out maybe run an errand and and also ran with the same thing he probably couldn't get up the hill because there's two ways up our up our, up our house and they probably blocked both entrances. <laughs> so he probably couldn't get in. And I just took our dogs and their two dogs, Rottweiler, two Rottweilers, can you imagine? Shoved it in my, my, um, into my supervisor's two-door prelude, Honda prelude. <laughs> and, and we just got up and left and we went down and we dropped off our dog to you know to the shelter but I, I remember the guys were saying just go just go we'll take care of it I don't know who these people were the fire and fire people weren't even there yet the fire um the fire department wasn't there yet and I I couldn't even think of what to take all I thought were my animals and and that was it and and we left thinking oh my god our house is going to go on fire and what's going to be left and so, of course, I have this aversion of fire. Every time I see fire in that area in our house or smell smoke, I just, you know, my, my, uh, I just get so nervous. But anyways, that's, ugh. so that's my thing about fires um, and, and just the thing about what California goes through year after year um, and why, why we have those issues. You know, um, they always say that they're going to, you know, do everything about clearing the area and, but it, it never happens. I don't know why that is, um, but until that does, um, you know, and, and there's always a human element. 
right? No, you, you brought up a huge point. First of all, thank you. What a great story. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and and, uh, and the, the story of the, the guys on your roof, like, who are these yes. guys? Like, so hosing down your yes. roof or whatever. Unbelievable. Uh, totally angels, right? And then, um, yeah, in those moments, all you can think about, it's like, it's so overwhelming. Like, yeah. oh my God, all this stuff. What am I going to do with all this stuff? All you think about is my animals, my children, my family, whatever it is, and we're going to get the hell out of here and stuff be damned, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, wow, what a fantastic story. And I knew you would have um, a cool fire story. So uh, thank, <laughs> you for, thank you for sharing that. And you brought up a really, really important point is that 99% uh, of, uh, uh, of wildfires are, tend to be, um, you know, natural cause, but the ones that are, are the worst tend to be these ones that are, that are human caused, right? And, and the ones that are preventable. Um, and in this situation here in New Mexico, we've got, you know, forest service people running around with uh, torches, you know, lighting the forest on fire, thinking, you know, that that's a good thing to do in a high winds day under super dry conditions and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's crazy. My, my thought on that stuff is that if they're going to do these prescribed burns, because I understand we're talking about thinning the forest, clearing the debris in the forest, but let's do that um, when, when uh, you know, during the rainy season or uh, after we've had the first couple of snowfalls or whatever it might be so that there's some moisture on the ground and that these things are not going to just, you know, get uh, totally out of control. The windy, windiest uh, time of year is our springtime for us. And so for you guys, it's the Santa Ana season, right? So yeah, crazy. Thank you so much, guys. I know we ran a couple minutes late. Um, I really appreciate uh, you showing up. I appreciate uh, you guys sharing uh, your thoughts and ideas. Um, and again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to be here and have a platform and, uh, and chat with you guys. So thanks a lot. Um, I don't think we have anything happening, um, later in the day. Um, oh, it is Wednesday night. Um, does anybody know if, um, if Glenn is doing his network marketing? I imagine that he is. Let me take a quick peek on, uh, at the calendar here, unless anybody can beat me to it. Um, and we'll call it a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, but let's see. I got the calendar. I know that Glenn's going to conventions, so I'm not sure. I know, but he's such a powerhouse that, you know. Yeah, true. He, he winds up doing just about anything. Um, I am not seeing it on the calendar. So, uh, you know, hospitality suite is open uh, for anybody that wants to get on and chat. Um, and then we'll have general session um, again tomorrow. I imagine that John um, or Shannon will be hosting. And then uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 Eastern, um, Adrian Garner, uh, our dear friend, will be doing um, life and business tools. Um, so tune in. Uh, thanks again. Glad to be here. Um, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great one. Get Thank you. Get Bye. Bye. Bye.